Hey there everybody, I am Raymond McNeil, host of Celtic Phoenix Productions, and welcome to the third video in a series covering the Vic Mignogna vs Funimation et al. lawsuit. I recommend listening to the previous videos uh, to get a better contextual sense for what will be said in this installment, uh, and you can find a playlist for this entire series in the iCards above or at the end of this video. Today we'll be covering all the evidence provided by defendants Monica Rial and Ronald Toyer, who are operating under the same attorney. This means that all of their motions are made jointly, combining their evidence together. This is by far the longest block of evidence among the parties, and one of the most frustrating due to how some of the evidence was delivered. You'll see what I mean when we get to the Google Doc that's listed in this evidence. Also prepare to turn your head at odd angles because a lot of these documents are actually sideways. They're some reason they're in landscape and not in portrait. Um, I don't know why they did that, but they did. As with the previous installment, the relevant court documents are available in the links down below. Uh, the relevant documents themselves, as I forgot to list them last time in the video, so I had to put up a word. Uh, but the relevant documents are titled Real and Toye TCPA Motion to Dismiss PDF. And the uh, Defendant Monica Real and Ronald Toye Supplement to Motion to Dismiss which were filed on uh, 2019-07-19 and 2019-07-30, respectively. If I missed a detail that you felt was relevant or important, please do not be afraid to let me know down below, and I will issue a correction if it should be warranted. Um, and feel free to give me your thoughts and opinions as we cover this case down in the comments as well. I would love to hear everyone's takes on it. So far, we've gotten a nice smattering of uh, support and and uh, for both sides of the case. So uh, I, I'm eager to see how people's opinions change upon looking upon this information. Now, with all that out of the way, let's dive right into the evidence. Now, the first piece of evidence as provided by Monica Rial and Ronald Toye is the deposition of Victor Mignogna, which is put front and foremost. However, as I have mentioned in the previous installments, the depositions of Vic, uh, of Vic Monica and Ron are all going to be listed in their own video and covered there because these are incredibly long documents. I mean, I'm, look how long it's going to take me to scroll through this. See what I mean? I think it goes up to like 150 pages? No, more than 150. More than 200. Oh, oh, oh there we go. Almost... 300 pages of deposition, so you can understand why I'm not going to cover it here when I already have so much more evidence to cover coming forward. Now, the second piece of evidence provided by them are two Twitter posts, or two a tweet and a reply to that tweet. Uh, the first tweet being at actually Amelia, and the second tweet being at Bakutos. Bakutos? Um, Amelia and Mur, respectively. Now, I've looked over these. They seem mostly to be describing rumors of Vic's behavior, but by all appearances, neither of these women seem to have any kind of first-hand knowledge of the accounts they were they, they were counting. So I'm pretty sure that these can be easily dismissed, other than to prove that there were, in fact, rumors about Vic. However, uh, this is mean I, I should mention, anything that happens after the initial tweet from uh, Han Lea, could possibly be discredited by saying they're just bandwagoning off the initial tweet. So that's this is shaky evidence at best. It's 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 hearsay at best. So I, I don't know how effective this will be at proving anything relevant to the case. The third piece of evidence is Polygon's January 25th, 2019 article about Victor Mignana. Uh, and yes, this is where you start seeing the sideways uh, pieces of evidence, which are incredibly annoying to deal with, I assure you. The fourth piece of evidence is Facebook's post by Jesse Pridemore that accuses an unnamed voice actor of rape and Vic himself of sexual harassment, uh, as well as the comments underneath that post. Her accused rapist, for clarification, the man she has accused of rape, not a man that has been convicted of rape, has since been revealed to be voice actor Todd Haberkorn, who retained the same law firm as Victor Mignogna in this case. In relation to Vic, she claims her rapist told everyone in the office that they had slept together. She claims that she saw him to be a shitty person to people uh, and staffers at conventions. 
She claims that after chatting with him at a convention, he grabbed her arm and prevented her from leaving while also making derogatory remarks towards her promiscuity. She claims he slid his hand through her hair and tugged hard twice before disparaging her again, all ending with her running off crying before discussing the events with a friend. At this time, no one related to this accused incident has come forward to confirm the story. There is a comment on the post by Cherno Alpha that reaffirms the statements indicating Vic's unpleasantness at the conventions. I'm not entirely sure which one is that. There's a lot of these. The next piece of evidence is Anime News Network's January 30th, 2019 article about Victor, Victor Mignogna. The next piece of evidence is Fixing the Staircase, an article by the Tao of Dragon Ball. Uh, now, as you've noticed, I've already skimmed over a few of the other articles in this case, like I did with the Funimation one. And I will repeat what I said here is that most of the articles featured here, these news articles, are to prove that the allegations against Vic being a sexual predator or something of the like have been around for a while. That's basically their point, is to show that the thing that damaged Vic was not the rumors themselves, that Vic basically did this to himself, something along those lines. It It's... I don't think super relevant to the case. Um, the the at least the details of the articles, other than saying the articles exist and they typically go along the same lines of saying it's been long rumored that Vic Mignogna did these things. So beyond that, I don't see a lot of relevance to them, uh, nor the comments afterwards, unless there's verifying information in there. And typically, they're people not making direct accusations against Vic in these comment sections. So unless that really pops up. I'm not going to be covering these in detail. I'm just going to be skimming over them. It's also another one of these pieces of evidence that's sideways, and it really annoys me. So I would like not to spend as much time on this, as little time on this as possible, honestly. It's also freaking long, this one is. Oh, come on. It's taking forever. Okay. The next piece of evidence is Rooster Teeth's announcement severing ties with Victor Mignogna. Um, now, this, this announcement is fairly straightforward and is relatively clean legally. There's no accusations, no implications, uh, just an announcement of fact. It's uh, no wonder that Rusteeth has managed to avoid legal troubles with Vic. Uh, they've, they've really done a good job of wording this particular severance message. I've already covered this in Funimation's evidence, but this is the next piece of evidence is Funimation's February 11th, 2019 uh, tweet. Uh, next is Gizmodo's February 19th, 2019 article about Victor Mignogna's allegations, uh, or the allegations against Vic Mignogna. The next exhibit is the Vic Kicks Back GoFundMe page, which I'm not entirely sure how that's relevant to the case at hand, but it's referenced. The next piece of evidence is an email exchange between Monica Rial, Jimmy Markey, and Chuck Huber. In this, Chuck Huber attempts to be the middleman and de-escalate the situation, though, unfortunately, his su suggestions, as I understand it, did nothing but add fuel to the fire. If you heard of it, this is where the infamous Vic Mignogna sex addict quote came from, which was never spoken by or approved of by Mr. Mignogna. Additionally, there are suggested scripts written by Huber for Rial, Marky, and Funimation, oh, and Toye as well, uh, but these were never said of or uh, these were never said by or approved of by any party in this case. Um, by all accounts, it looks like this is Chuck Huber trying to mend a split between what he perceived as his friends group. Um, so I don't detect any kind of malice or spite in, in these interactions. It's a very interesting document the way he tried to perceive what was going on and try to, to figure it out. I'm not entirely sure what this document's being included to prove. Uh, but it's there, so you can read it for yourself. The next piece of evidence is Mr. Mignogna's uh, January 20th, 2019 tweet, which was previously covered. The next uh, piece of evidence is an email correspondence between Monica Rial and Colleen Carroll at Funimation. This discussion is in relation to a confused apology from Vic to Monica, who claims to have no knowledge of injuring Monica physically or emotionally. He reaffirms his friendship with her and expresses willingness to change with the help of a counselor. However, Monica appears not to have replied to this and simply forwarded the message to Colleen uh, Carroll uh, as an example of what Vic always does in order to use his charm to get out of this. She continues, he knows what he did and that he was told by Sony not to contact her. The next piece of evidence is Mr. Mignogna's February 13th, 2019 tweet, which again, previously covered. 
The next piece of evidence is Vic's public approval of the Vic Kicks Back GoFundMe page. This is the tweet that Vic used to announce his retention of a law firm as the last and only recourse to salvage his reputation and 20-year career. He expresses approval of Nick Ricado's Vic Kicks Back GoFundMe, affirms he does not and will not manage it, nor receive any of the funds personally. He names the Salvation Army Dallas uh, domestic violence and abuse shelters as the benefactories for any runoff funds from the GoFundMe when the court case concludes. The next piece of evidence is a character statement on Victor Mignogna by a woman by the name of Alyssa Floody. Uh, Alyssa Floody states herself to be a freelance manager for comic conventions and has known Vic for over 10 years, uh, more likely 11 at the time of uh, recording. Uh, this piece is mostly a testimony to Vic's character and a very positive one, which is confusing to me because this is the defense's evidence, who have everything to gain from making Vic look like a right bastard. I have no idea what this is doing in the defense's evidence, but, um, I mean, you can read it yourself. This is, she doesn't seem to have a problem with the guy. I don't know why this is here. You would think the defense would try to be a little harsher on Vic. Now, the next piece of evidence is Mr. Mignogna's independent contractor agreement to voice act for Rooster Teeth Productions. This contract tells us nothing because Vic's severance happened after the contract with Rooster Teeth had expired. I'm not sure why this is here either. Uh, this contract was set to expire after April 30th, 2019, but by my understanding, Vic fulfilled the requirements of the contract and it was completed before the events of the accusations took place. He was no longer bound by it and neither were Rooster Teeth. How relevant this will be in the long run, I don't know. This is very thick legalese, even for me, and I can't quite pierce it. So it may have some kind of importance later down the line, but... I'm doubtful on that matter. Uh, again, I, I encourage you to read all this stuff on your own time uh, to double check what I'm saying. The next piece of evidence is Monica Rial's amended objections and responses to plaintiff's first interrogatories and requests for production. Uh, to sort out this that whole gobbledygook of legalese up there, this document is Rial and Toye's response to Mignogna's attorneys asking for information and evidence related to the case. As you may have guessed, there was a broad rejection across the board to almost all requests for information. Not surprisingly, this is a hostile lawsuit. However, in answer to interrogatory 4, let me scroll down to interrogatory 4 here. Interrogatory 4 asks to identify the instance in the mid-2000s, including the name of the convention, when the plaintiff grabbed you and kissed you in his hotel room, as you alleged in the tweets you posted at Realisms on February 19th, 2019. Real recounts the events of this circumstance in detail. She states that the events occurred on Sunday, November 4th, 2007 at IzumiCon in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. The uh, convention chairman, Stan Dolan, invited Vic and Rial to dinner after several other guests had already left. Vic requested Rial join him in his room to watch his fan film, Full Metal Fantasy, um, and Dolan stated that he would collect both of them for dinner at Vic's room. Vic played the video as promised while Rial stood and watched. However, soon, Vic grabbed Rial by the upper arms and began to kiss her without consent. Rial attempted to resist, but was physically restrained and pushed on the bed. Vic held her down and continued to kiss her. This continued until Dolan came to the door, at which point Vic left the bed in order to answer it. Dolan inquired if Rial was okay, clearly noting her distress. She was too shocked and afraid to admit what had occurred. Following this, Vic forced Rial to speak with his fiance on the telephone, and Vic spoke to the fiance as if nothing had happened. That was her recounting of events from these interrogatories, and that will become relevant in a future installment. This is the second of several times that she has recounted this allegation against Vic, and that itself will become relevant later down the line, though for now, let's move on. The next piece of evidence is a live journal article by Noruki chan from April 20th, 2010, detailing the rumors of a panel hel uh, that Vic held at te uh, Tekoshokan. According to a source that is not the original writer, Vic held a panel at Tekoshokan that addressed rumors he was aware of on uh, Kosfu and 4chan, two different websites. Um, 
I'm, I'm pretty sure everyone knows what 4chan is. According to this, most of the panel was spent rambling about hurt feelings over the rumors. Apparently, he addressed rumors he would leave voice acting and become a minister, accusations he was homophobic because he wouldn't sign ya uh, yaoi posters, accusations of being a drunk, anger over fans pushing his faith on others, uh, among a handful of other uh, different accusations that he decided to cover. Included in this post is a YouTube link of one part of the panel itself. However, the videos themselves are not submitted to the court and thus are most likely not evidence in of themselves. Almost this entire page is hearsay and thus more than likely inadmissible unless the writer and the person they were quoting step forward to testify or the video is submitted as evidence. This post also included a number of comments that followed, though none, as I understood, really seemed relevant to the case at hand. The next piece of evidence is a letter from Mignana's attorneys requesting uh, corrections, clarifications, or retractions of Jamie Markey's public statements. This came with attached public statements, all of which are her tweets. Uh, below are a few examples of the tweets in question. The February 6th tweet stating Jamie wants his head, she wants his balls, she wants him to feel an ounce of the pain he's caused others, and then for him to fucking choke on it. The February 8th tweet stating her story with attached image of her allegation of him pulling her hair and whispering in her ear, as well as, uh, as well allege he is guilty of assault among a number of other allegations. The February 7th tweet where she said Jesus would light Vic on fire and send him to hell, though this is implied, I believe it is in response to a tweet that mentions Vic in specific. Uh, so, while it's not stating Vic directly in the tweet itself, it's pretty clear who she's referencing. I think it's pretty reasonable to assume. Additional to this is a request from Mignana's attorneys to preserve electronically stored information to, Bami, uh, to Jamie Markey. This is basically asking her to preserve evidence and informing her that destroying evidence is against the law, and in doing so would incriminate her further. Uh, it's actually a very interesting uh, uh, principle under the law. If you have evidence that the other side had evidence and they destroyed it, then whatever evidence that was going to be is supposed to be looked upon them in on that party, the destroying party, in the most negative light possible. Um, so basically, it's like an automatic point against the 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 party that destroys evidence. Um, so yes, that's just it's basically just housekeeping matters. The next piece of evidence is a correspondence between Victor Mignana and Tammy Denbo via email regarding the investigation against Vic. This email details the lead-up to the phone call shared between Mignana and Denbo in accordance with her investigation, as well as follow-up information where Mignana defends against certain allegations. In relations to Sarah Bachmeyer, the previously unnamed ex-Funimation employee, he claims that they shared a friendly relationship and a single consensual kiss, as opposed to the accusations that the kiss between them was non-consensual. Vic reiterates the platonic nature of his relationship with Monica Rial and a, makes a refutation of any subversive meaning behind the jelly bean joke he shared with her at a panel. Additionally, he adds that there have been multiple After Dark panels where more risque content has been openly discussed and none of that has been referenced either in this court case or in the larger general public outcry. He also adds that he would be willing to make a heartfelt apology for any offense despite not having any prior indication to it. In response to this final question, Denbo requests that he not contact anyone involved in her investigation. The next document is a Google Docs file listing a number of allegations made against Mignana. The allegations are as follow. At Michelle MCC73 accuses Vic of making advances on her when she was a student and minor while he was a cameraman and video producer for the Thomas Road Baptist Church, which was attached to her school Liberty Christian Academy in Lynchburg, Virginia. These occurred in 1989 when Vic was 26. Robin Egg claims that while he was living in Lynchburg, Virginia, uh, where Vic graduated Liberty University, he lured her to his house to view a new worship video, removed his shirt, and pushed her onto the bed when she was 16. He was 27 at the time, according to her. At Sharon B891 8965 uh, claims Vic was her 11th grade uh, English teacher from 1986 to 1987 and was fired before the end of the year, rumored to be as a result of being inappropriate with students. There is a reiteration of Jesse Pridemore's earlier Facebook post. There's a list of voice actors who have alleged harassment or sexually inappropriate behavior from Victor Mignana. 
including Monica Rial, Jamie Markey, Samantha Inu Hart, Neil Kaplan, Jesse Pridemore, a voice actress named Charlotte, who may also be Monica Rial, a voice actress named Rachel, a voice actor named Gretchen, um, or actress named Gretchen, uh, professional cosplayer Diana, and convention staffer L.J. Montel uh, Montello. There's a list of voice actors and industry professionals who allege to have witnessed harassment or sexually inappropriate behavior from Victor Mignogna, including Samantha Inuel Hart, former Funimation and current Rooster Teeth employee Michelle Sontag, convention staffer Andrea Romero, writing in 2019 about Akon 2013, voice actor Donald A. Schultz, voice actor Josh Greeley, uh, convention staffer Extermination, writing in 2019, possibly about Animathon 2007, Convention staffer Silent Sakura, convention staffer Siri, uh, producer and writer Emmett Plant, writing in 2019 about Bayoucon 2013, convention staffer L.J. Montello, writing in 2019 about a Sen Year Unknown. Uh, for the sake of expediency, I'm not going to list all the individuals in future lists. There are a lot of them, and none of the accusations are being detailed directly in this document for any of these, so I'm just going to note the remaining lists. There is a list of voice actors or industry professionals who allege to witnessing Vic's rude behavior towards convention staffers. There is a list of voice actors or industry professionals who support hashtag Vic, uh, Kick Vic or believe the accusations. A statement from Vic's uh, ex fiance Michelle Specht, in regards to their breakup and previously unknown allegations against Vic. A list of private individuals who allege to have seen harassment or sexually inappropriate behavior from Vic. A list of private individuals who allege to have seen rude behavior towards convention staffers from Vic. A list of industry professionals or private individuals who allege that Vic Mignogna was banned or removed from specific conventions for sexually inappropriate behavior or rude behavior towards convention staffers. A list of voice actors or industry professionals who allege that Vic Mignogna was previously cautioned or warned about a sexually inappropriate behavior. A list of alleged information from industry professionals or private individuals on the internal investigation carried out by Funimation that resulted in termination of Vic Mignogna. Side note, I hate this document. It makes my eyes bleed. And the fact that almost all this evidence listed here is inside of hyperlinks uh, makes me unsure as to if they're technically submitted evidence. According to the federal evidentiary standards, each link must be prevent, presented as its own piece of evidence individually, so I'm erring on no at this point. But if I'm corrected on a state level or something, because I know it's not the case in Ohio for sure, I'll go back through all of this on its own video. I am praying, however, that the links are not considered listed evidence. Because Jesus Christ, I do not want to go through this document ever again. From what I can tell, the next piece of independent evidence is a post from Mignogna to his fan club, the Risen Bull Rangers. Uh, in the post, he encourages people to go out and do whatever they can to counter all these lies and negativity, citing the good people doing nothing adage to battle evil. Uh, this post also has a further refutation of all the accusations being made against him. Now we're on to the big stuff. We're actually starting to um, cover flat-out accusations against Vic. This is the affidavit of Robin Michelle Blankenship McConnell, uh, Mignogna's 1989 accuser. Robin was a sophomore in high school in 1989 at Lynchburg Christian Academy, now Liberty Christian Academy, in Lynchburg, Virginia. She claims to have been a cast member of the school play Mousetrap, where she was introduced to Mignogna, who was assisting with production and direction. Mignogna was approximately 26 at the time. She claims he would stay late after the other students and teachers had left, taking special interest in her in order to rehearse more. Additionally, he would supposedly play love songs for her at the piano. Vic would occasionally stop by her work at Billy Joe, uh, Joe's Ice Cream Parlor, which is no longer in operation. One day in the summer of 1989, Vic approached her on her way home from work and asked her to come with him to view a Christian worship video he had been working on. She agreed. At his home, there was another man present who Vic got in an argument with. She suspect over her presence in the house. After the man left, Vic went into his bedroom and came out shirtless wearing only a small revealing shorts. She claims to have then realized there was no video and was uncomfortable. He then sat next to her and began to put his arms around her and touch her, pulling her hair out of its ponytail and playing with it. He then licked her ear and stated, let's just enjoy each other. 
She says that she froze as he continued to make his unwanted advances. She says she told him she needed to leave, that her mother would be looking for her, and after several verbal rejections, she shoved him off and left. He was supposedly very rude to her and upset following this. She attempted to tell her youth minister, but he was out of the office at the time that she attempted to tell him. Following this, she has been scared and uncomfortable around Vic when she saw him around town until he moved to Houston shortly thereafter. The next piece of evidence is the affidavit of Kara Edwards, a uh, voice actress, and the 2008 An Amazement and 2010 ShadowCon accuser Vic Mignogna. Kara Edwards is a fellow voice actor from Funimation. She accuses Vic of unwanted sexual advances and harassment at An Amazement 2008. She alleges that they befriended each other during this, uh, the course of this convention, uh, during which she informed him uh, she was married and that she thought that Vic was gay due to his appearance and behavior. Additionally, the two had different rooms that were connected to each other via a door, as some hotels actually have. On the Sunday of that convention, a hug between the two of them that went on too long indicated to her that Vic wanted more than friendship from her. After returning to her room, she called her husband goodnight and started hearing Vic knocking on their conjoined door, calling her via the phones, requesting she open the door and that nobody has to know. She reminded him that she was married and refused to open the door. She also knew at this time of Vic's relationship with Michelle Specht. When Vic persisted, she retreated to her bathroom, locked herself in, and turned on the shower while sitting on the floor until she felt safe again. She told another voice actor the next day about uh, what had happened and several other Funimation actors she's friends with, presumably in the days following uh, by her wording. Though that's an assumption on my part. The next convention they saw each other at was Non Desicon at uh, Denver, Colorado in 2008. Uh, there was supposedly no foul play at this event. In 2010, however, she attended ShadowCon in Tampa, Florida as a guest. In 2010, she and Vic both attended ShadowCon in Tampa, Florida as guests. During this, they were both in the hotel and on the way to the convention when he needed to retrieve something from his room to show her. He had not been hitting on her up until that point, and so she suspected there was no lingering sexual interest in her. She describes Vic's room as a suite with a foyer and a sofa. She sat in a chair near the sofa, and he sat on the sofa next to her. They began a conversation about her recent divorce, and at some point Vic dropped to his knees and began massaging her thighs and buttocks. In a creep, seductive voice, uh, he said, Let me be sweet to you. Kara at that point stood and tried to get away, but he blocked her, grabbing her and pulling her into an uncomfortably long hug, rubbing his hands up and down her back, trying to console her about her divorce. He then pressed his face to hers close enough without kissing her directly. He would not let go and reiterated that uh, what he had said about being sweet to her multiple times. She claims that he said that his fiancée was jealous because she could detect a connection between the two of them, which she emphatically denied immediately. She says she was frozen stiff and cannot recall how she was able to get out of his embrace, but shortly after she left his room. On Saturday, she went out to eat with a friend uh, and Mignogna trying to keep the peace because of the power he supposedly had in the industry at the time. She felt safe with friends present. Returning to the hotel, they ran into Mary Reese and her son. She claims Mignogna pulled her away, insisting to escort her to her room. Kara felt she could not refuse and allowed him to do so. She claims she subconsciously begged Mary for help. Arriving at the hotel room, Mignogna asked to come inside and Kara refused. She reminded him of his engagement and her friendship with Michelle Specht. Vic's response was to underplay that friendship. She continued to refuse, did not let him in, and eventually he left. The next day, Kara confided with Mary over both this and the 2008 incident, uh, and that she was terrified of Mignogna. Supposedly, Vic, in retaliation, requested her table be moved so that she had to sign in a less popular area of the convention as far away from him as possible. On that Sunday, several volunteers confided in her experiences with Mignogna, including him yelling at them, creating impromptu autograph signings in the hallways which created fire hazards, and making his liaisons cry. She claims to have heard these stories at multiple conventions going forward. Since ShadowCon, uh, she has informed her mother, Funimation employees, and other voice actors and friends about the incidents and how she was scared of further retaliation. She controverts a statement made by Vic that they drank wine together at ShadowCon and made out together, claiming to have never consensually kissed Mignogna. She has spent the following years avoiding being in the same space as Vic at any one given point in time. 
In 2012, Kara was approached by Vic for a role in his fan continuation of Star Trek, Star Trek Continues. Uh, Kara performed a few test shots at home for storyboarding, but was later told Michelle had uh, learned of the arrangement and Vic was unable to cast her. Michelle was supposedly cast for the role instead. Later conferring with Michelle, Michelle does not remember the events in question or anything of the ilk. Kara now avoids working with Mignana or interacting with him altogether. She recounts a project she was casting where Vic was the director. During recording of the first session, she was uncomfortable, and afterwards, he asked her to dinner. She agreed, but stood him up, and later requested a different director, which was complied to by Funimation. She was ready and willing to provide testimony when Vic's investigation opened before she knew that he had been fired. She sent this notice to Colleen Clink entering a Simon at Funimation. She has turned down three convention invitations already because Vic planned to attend. She still fears retaliation. The remainder of her affidavit is complaining about being doxxed by Kiwi Farms, who are generally pro-Vic. Attached to her affidavit is an email between Kara Edwards and an unknown recipient regarding Vic's behavior listed in her affidavit. Uh, most likely the recipients are Colin Clink and Trina Simon, as stated in her affidavit, though that is unconfirmed because the, the names of the recipients are blacked out. The next piece of evidence is the affidavit of Lynn Hunt. Lynn has been a convention worker since 2000, uh, having filled the following positions since that time. ADH slash DH panel programming, ADH slash DH guest relationship, uh, guest relations, uh, DH video programmer, DH convention operations, and contest coordinators. I'm not entirely sure what any of those acronyms mean, but that's, that's her fault for not specifying. Uh, she has encountered Vic on multiple occasions during conventions and remarks how his reputation made him a high-risk guest, which required consistent monitoring during interactions with young girls and females. She claims Vic was known to be difficult to work with and requires certain amounts of attention from staff and organizers. She also remarks he is supposedly rude to staff and other guests. Her first encounter with Vic was in 2003 at OhioCon in Columbus, Ohio. She witnessed multiple instances of Vic inappropriately touching fans, guests, and other convention patrons. She witnessed a number of fans uncomfortable after Vic touched them. She also heard over the staff radio that someone should step in and confront him about his inappropriate touching. She believes many of the fans he touched inappropriately were under the age of 18. In 2004, she was working the Anime Central Convention in Chicago, Illinois, working directly with guests and technical professionals to ensure timely executions of events for fans on a strict schedule. She claims to have witnessed Vic's difficult behavior and tantrums while working with him. She also witnessed Vic handing out his phone number to many young female fans, as well as inappropriately groping and kissing girls, many of whom she suspects were underaged. While working at Anime Central Convention in 2005 in a panel programming, she claimed to have received a number of complaints about Vic's behavior. Supposedly, he took too much time during his panels, cutting into other guests' scheduled appointments, and treated staff poorly. After this, Vic was supposedly banned from Anime Central Convention, and his appearance that year had apparently been allowed by circumventing invitation channels. Apparently, in 2004, she was working at TakoshoCon as a contest coordinator and claims that Mignana was also banned from that convention for his poor behavior. Due to his popularity, Vic was supposedly brought back to 2007's Takosho Kong. During this time, he allegedly took interest in Japanese singer Mari Ijima and supposedly stalked her, leading to increased security conditions around the convention. Also during this convention, Vic apparently went missing for several hours during Saturday and was discovered alone in his hotel room with an underage female fan. He was again supposedly banned from the convention after this. In 2009, Lin was in guest relations at Anime Central Convention and Vic was invited by an individual outside of her department circumventing the ban from 2005. Lynn was assigned to handle Vic, who demanded a number of panels and autograph opportunities more than the other guests. She complied to avoid uh, being treated poorly. During the Saturday, he requested a change in schedule to rest, and after confirming it, he supposedly hugged Lynn and groped her rear. She stopped working conventions in 2010, citing Mignana as one of the main reasons she retired from the field. She has received many apologies over the years from fellow co-workers and superiors about the behavior that she endured while managing Mignana. The next piece of evidence is the affidavit of Faisal Ahmed. He is the CEO of the Kauai Khan Convention in Anime Weekend Atlanta. He has been aware of Mignana's reputation for many years. Seven years prior to Anime 
the Central Convention in Rosemont, Illinois, he saw Vic being overly friendly with a female cosplayer. He then saw what he interpreted as the girl removing herself from a situation to avoid confrontation. He went to Sarah Sullivan, a Funimation employee at the time, and reported this. She said it was commonplace for Vic. He has received reports from Anime Weekend Atlanta and Kawaii Con about Minyana. He presents Erica McCord, a guest relations worker, as an example, as she served as Vic's personal assistant that weekend. He portrays her as a naive fan who discovers her idol is not who she thought he was and requested to no longer be assigned to him. He also says he overheard a story that Vic had kissed her without consent, and this is why she, he believes she did not want to work with him in the future. He concluded that if he had known, he would not have invited Vic back to Anime Weekend Atlanta ever again. Do note that Erica McCord has submitted her own affidavit to the plaintiff, so we'll be hearing from that when I cover the plaintiff's filings in the next video. Faisal Ahmed also received complaints from Kauai Khan conventions citing Kelly Loftus. Kelly has given her own affidavit to the defense. We'll skip this particular entry as a consequence. Attached to this affidavit is her email to him. He also cites Leia Hamilton, also known as Leia Rose, a cosplayer who was supposedly aggressively pursued by Minyana while both were in committed relationships. Supposedly, Leia publicly denouncing him only ended with media backlash against her and Kauai Khan from the Risen Bull Rangers. As a result of these accusations, Kawaii Khan and Anime Weekend Atlanta senior staff decided to ban Minyana without the input or influence of Rial, Marky, Toye, or Funimation. He claims to have not signed a contract that guarantees Vic's appearance at either of the conventions and states it could be withdrawn at any time without penalty. He ends by claiming he has been targeted, stalked, and harassed by fans of Minyana, citing a spam of 500 emails during a two-hour period and a contact from the state of Hawaii because of a complaint filed by one of Vic's fans. The next piece of evidence is the affidavit of Mary Reese. She was a guest relations convention worker of 13 years and a special guest coordinator at MetroCon convention in Tampa, Florida. She met Vic in 2010 at ShadowCon convention in Tampa. She served as Vic's assistant and handler for nine years due to age and experience watching him interact with fans and young girls. She knows what he is capable of. She claims Vic makes advances on females in their early 20s or younger and first thought he was gay based on mannerisms. She suspects this is a ploy for females to trust him. She claims that Vic changes his voice and demeanor depending on the audience and peers, and that his voice when talking to fans is intentionally non-threatening. However, she claims when fans are not around, he changes his voice and personality to that of someone different than who the fans see. In other news, this floor is made out of floor, and water is wet. What kind of statement is this? It's called a persona, Mary. It's very basic psychological fact. Moving on. She recalls picking him up at the airport and experiencing his diva-type behavior. He insisted a broken wheel on a suitcase get fixed immediately, causing delay, which affected two other guests. He also insisted on the purchase of certain items, such as food or drink, and not reimbursing the liaisons and handlers. Based upon her personal interactions, she has determined that Vic is a bully with unreasonable demands. She has witnessed him yell at staff about trivial things to the point they cry. At 2017's Metrocom, she assisted him with his autograph line, where he required that she ask every fan to buy more merchandise directly from him. When she apparently failed to upsell a fan, Vic became rude and aggressive and reiterated that they needed to upsell. At ShadowCon in 2010, she met Kara Edwards. Uh, she encountered Kara returning to the lobby from dinner with friends. While talking to Kara and saying goodbye, Vic came over and demanded to escort Kara up to her room. Vic grabbed Kara and took her up to her room uh, on the promise of being her protector. Kara confided in Mary the next morning that Vic had tried to force himself on her, that she reminded him that he was still engaged, but he indicated his engagement did not matter. She also conveyed a threat Vic said about making or breaking Kara's career in the industry. She was present when Vic demanded Kara's autograph booth be moved to another room, decreasing her visibility. She also witnessed Vic grab Kara by the back of the head and pull her hair and head backwards forcibly while flirting with her and suggesting they pose like on a romance novel. Vic asked Mary to take a picture, during which Kara leaned away. It is Mary's belief Kara allowed the photo to avoid creating a scene. On Friday evening at ShadowCon, Vic supposedly invited Mary up to his room after dinner, saying he wanted her uh, to keep fans away. 30 minutes later, she found him playing piano in the lobby with several young girls and a crowd around him. After the public accusations against Vic were made in 2019, several fans have requested MetroCon invite him and retract their invitation to Rial. 
In 2017, after Metrocon guests were saying goodbye to staff in the guest green room, Vic asked to take a picture with Mary. She did not want the photo taken, but agreed in order to keep the peace. When taking the photo, he placed his cheek against hers, and in a second photo, he kissed her on the temple. She says she did not consent nor want the kiss, or the embrace that preceded it. The next piece of evidence is the affidavit of Whitney Falba. She was a Takosho Khan convention worker in 2007 in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania when she first met Vic. Uh, she was the live events chair who oversaw keeping events on time, working with guest relations to ensure guest schedules, verifying details for events, and making sure organizers show up on time. She claims that Vic is not a polite person to work with or deal with directly. Often, he would ignore requests of handlers and staff members to keep him on schedule with events. Uh, she witnessed several conversations where Vic was disrespectful to the staff without reason, particularly towards female workers. She claims she saw Vic touching young female guests and male guests during autograph sessions inappropriately and did not ask for consent. Several guests approached after interacting with Vic Mignogna, claiming they still felt uncomfortable he touched them, and she directed them to the security office. The affection included tight hugs that lasted longer than normal, moving hands down the lower backside of a female, and grabbing a woman's hair. She noticed numerous guests looked uncomfortable while at his table and requested a security guard stand next to him to monitor his behavior. In one incident, she claimed Vic disappeared about 30 to 45 minutes prior to a scheduled appearance. At the same time, a group of parents went to the security office to find their 14-year-old daughters who went missing. It was reported over the radio that Vic and the girls were located in Vic's hotel room alone. Vic apparently wanted special time with the girls and promised them props from Full Metal Alchemist that uh, he had in his hotel room. Upon locating him, Vic appeared angry and the attitude disturbed Whitney. Vic became incredibly rude to Whitney and reiterated multiple times he had done nothing wrong, though she had not accused him of anything at that point. This raised her suspicions. The family received free admission for the weekend and did not press charges. Following this, Vic became difficult to handle, and workers had to struggle to make him arrive to events on time. Believing Vic to be high-risk to young and underage girls, she set one to two workers to be with him at all times. Also during this convention, Whitney organized a full metal forum uh, panel and asked Vic to join, though with noted hesitance. She provided Vic an outline of the questions for discussion. Vic then went off-topic shortly after the panel started, claiming her topics weren't interesting. She claims he hijacked the panel and overshadowed the other panelists. After the panel, he requested another autograph session, regardless of the fact they needed to clear the room for the next event. Additionally, Vic made a last-minute request to hold a religious service headed by him that Sunday. She provided a space, but Vic complained and mocked the location of the entire service for its lack of grandiosity. He made comments to the effect that Takosho Khan hated Christians because of the room size, and he would revolt and take over the largest space in the convention, regardless what was scheduled. She claims the service was more to self-aggrandize on Vic's part, and as a Christian, she claimed it was not a religious service. Vic was allegedly not asked to return to the convention for several years due to his behavior. He was allowed to return in 2010 with an extra security detail at all times. There are supposedly other events that occurred, but she did not witness them firsthand. The next piece of evidence is the affidavit of Nesha Perry. Nesha is an Orion's Envy dancer, which is a performance group who dress up as Orion characters from Star Trek. She met Vic on June 29th, 2013 at Bayou Con in Lake Charles, Louisiana. She and her group were guests, as was Vic. After one of her performances, Vic held a panel discussing and viewing his fan project, Star Trek Continues. During this, Vic sat in the audience with the Orion's Envy's group without their permission. He sat next to Dayana Price, one of the members at the time, where he put his hand on her leg and stroked it without permission or consent. Mrs. Price appeared uncomfortable and tried to cover up her leg multiple times. After the panel that evening, the dance group was invited to a party at the hotel by one of the con's producers, Justin Tonet. During this party, Nesha witnessed Vic walk up to Diana, grasp her hair from the back, aggressively pull her backwards, and whisper into her ear. What was said is unknown, but Diana appeared angry, uncomfortable, and upset. She did not consent to any of it. By Nesha's accusation. Mrs. Price was married at the time that Vic made his advances. Afterwards, a buddy system was instituted inside of the dance group around specifically just Vic Mignogna. The group has spoken of this incident to friends. They have seen Vic since, but on every subsequent occasion, he has ignored them. The next piece of evidence is Emmett Plant. He is the boyfriend of Nesha Perry, a producer, composer, and 
and an engineer who frequently guests at conventions due to working on the Star Trek franchise. He met Vic on June 29, 2013 at BayouCon in Lake Charles, Louisiana. This is also where he met future girlfriend Nasha Perry. He reiterates that while gathered outside the portico of a local hotel to go to an after show off-site, he witnessed Vic grab Diana Price by the back of her neck and Hare pull her down and hiss something into her ear. He noted this was inappropriate, strange, and that Diana had not consented to this and looked uncomfortable. After this, the Orion's Envy group created a buddy system to make sure that none were ever alone with Vic Mignogna. After speaking out against Vic, several fans of Vic have uh, messaged and threatened him, which continues up to the time of this affidavit. He knows of others who have received similar harassment. Between this and Nasha Perry's affidavit, and I forgot to scroll to... Emmett Plant's affidavit. Here is a Emmett Plant's affidavit. My apologies. I do have the question of where Diana Price's affidavit is in all this. That would seem to be key as she is the direct victim of Vic in these accusations. If we get her testimony, we not only have one victim, but also two witnesses to the event in question, and that's very strong evidence for the defense. So the fact that it's absent is questionable. Um, perhaps they're waiting for further filing, but we'll have to see for the future if this gets past TCPA. The next piece of evidence is the affidavit of Adam Sheehan. Adam is a tenure employee at Funimation, having worked between 2004 and 2014, organizing and scheduling talent, appearances at conventions and events, as well as doing brand management. Adam first met and worked with Vic during the production of Full Male Alchemist and was involved in scheduling Vic's appearances at a number of conventions. He says that he has directly witnessed Vic's behavior at work, conventions, and off the clock. He states that Vic did not have a good reputation in the voice acting industry. Despite his talent, he is not worth the effort of employing. He says that he is aware of many studios who have chosen not to employ him on projects thanks to his difficult personality. He claims Vic would frequently contact Funimation and Crunchyroll where Adam now works, requesting work as a voice actor and to appear at conventions. He comments that this is weird because studios or conventions would typically request an actor's attendance than the other way around where a, an actor requests to be in attendance. He states Vic is an independent contractor to Funimation. He claims that Funimation installed a number of locks around the office to separate employees from voice actors and the recording studio, and they were nicknamed Vic Locks by Adam and other employees. Adam believed Vic to be very self-absorbed and would act differently around Adam due to his ability to change Vic's schedule and report him to the superiors. He believes that Vic has serial predatory tendencies. He has heard a number of stories about Vic's inappropriate behavior at conventions. He witnessed Vic hug, kiss, and touch fans, including minors, in ways he believed inappropriate. He claims Vic appears to intentionally put his hands on women's bodies. He claims Vic would frequently attend less prestigious conventions in order to dictate the terms and to avoid conventions with the power to curb his misbehavior. He uses Anime Matsuri in Houston, Texas as an example of a convention with a bad reputation and has allegations of sexual harassment and misconduct. He avoids sending talent to that convention. He states guests of conventions are compensated by fans paying for merchandise and autographs and photos. He claims Vic has a tendency to lie. As example, he cites Vic telling him he was friends with William Shatner, which Shatner has publicly de uh, denied. He also claims Vic misrepresents his age to appear younger. He says that he used to be close friends with the voice actor Todd Haberkorn, who works with Vic. He believes Todd's reputation is being negatively impacted by association with Vic. The next piece of evidence is the affidavit of Kelly Loftus. She is a convention goer and artist and has been since 2002. She first met Vic while working her artist booth at Kauai Con in 2014 in Honolulu, Hawaii. She was 27 at the time. She was cosplaying male character Ren Mihashi from the anime Big Windup for the first day of the convention. Kelly says her friend was a big fan of Vic at the time, though Kelly herself was not. Also, Vic appeared to have no line in his booth at the time. She took a box of chocolates to his table to get it signed for her friend. When there, even after clarifying her friend was the fan, not she, he flirted with her using a seductive voice and calling her princess despite the male costume. She was uncomfortable, but shrugged it off. After signing the box, they took a picture together to show her friend, hey, guess who I'm with, though she cannot remember if it was her or Vic's suggestion. During the photo, he was very handsy, grabbing her and holding her flesh to his body. 
After taking the picture, she made an offhand comment about her friend being angry because she would be jealous of Kelly meeting Vic. She then claims that Vic said, oh, let's make her really angry. He then instructed her to look at the camera again, which she says was a trick for him to give her a big hug and a kiss on the cheek for the second photo. She recalls thinking something to the effect of, it's something wrong with you, I'm here for my friend, I am not a fan of yours. On January 17, 2019, after seeing the news of the allegations against Vic, she posted her story about Kawaii Khan to, uh, to Twitter and reached out privately to Kawaii Khan on January 19th to report the incident. Receiving no reply, she made another post on January 21st, reiterating her story and remarking Kawaii Khan's lack of reply. Kawaii Khan replied a few days later, requesting a full report on the assault. She sent an email with the full details on January 27th. She claims Kawaii Khan then performed an investigation which resulted in Vic being banned permanently from the convention. All posts and emails she mentioned, except the email describing an investigation and Vic being banned permanently, are attached as exhibits to her affidavit. She shared her story to warn the public, originally thinking her circumstances were rare, but after seeing the very public backlash about unwanted hugs and kisses, she decided to corroborate uh, the woman being called liars, harassed, stalked, and bullied for sharing their bad experiences with Mignana. This connects to the testimony of Faisal Ahmed, CEO of Kauai Khan. The next piece of evidence is the affidavit of Michelle Specht. Ms. Specht is Mignana's former girlfriend of four years and fiancé of eight. Uh, she first met Vic in 2006 during Anime Expo convention in Los Angeles, California. Following a celebrity panel he was on, Vic asked if he knew her. The two spent hours together that weekend, and following the convention began their 12-year relationship. Their wedding in 2014 was postponed three days beforehand, and ultimately the two did not marry. Specht also serves as an actor, voice actor, and regular role in Vic's Star Trek Continues fan series from 2013 to 2018. They ended their relationship in May of 2018. This affidavit is mostly used to provide emails between herself and Vic, of which there are four. Uh, the first email seems to be a rant from Michelle sent to Vic on March 14th, 2019. Uh, this rant encompasses her reaction to the public allegations against Vic, reflections on Vic's infidelity while in a relationship with Michelle, and quite a lot that seems more relevant to coloring Vic's character than proving any given allegations. And it should be noted that Lisa Hansel is copied on this email. Who Lisa is, Michelle never says, so... The second email is apparently Vic's response on March 19th. It is comparably shorter, and it contains words of remorse, regret, and to some degree apology. The only tangible information we can take from this email is that Vic is indeed seeing a counselor and is fully committed to healing. In the third email, Michelle claims she doesn't need to pray for Vic's destruction. She had the opportunity, ammunition, and justification to do so easily for almost a year. Again, beyond that statement, there is not much beyond emotional fluff. Both she and Vic seem to have a knack for talking dramatically in writing. In the fourth email, Vic claims there are no right words to heal what he's done. Uh, he reiterates feelings of shame and remorse for what hurt he caused Michelle, affirming a goal to get real healing and make amends. The next piece of evidence is the affidavit of John Prager. John Prager is a convention security worker and has been since 2003. He was head of security at TechCoshoCon in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania from 2004 to 2011. He is also on the board of directors. He claims to have been involved with several events uh, concerning Victor Mignana. He accuses Vic of stalking and harassing Ijima Mori, a musician and guest of the convention. Ijima notified then-CEO of the convention, Jim Gogol, that Vic had been stalking her and was trying to get into her hotel room. It was decided that Ijima should be moved to a different room, and security should keep an eye on Vic. After this incident, Vic was apparently banned from TechoCon until about 2015, when the new board of directors invited him back. Prager claims he was among the number that voted to ban Vic. Based upon his years of professional experience and personal interactions, John believes Vic to be a sexual predator. He claims Vic does not care about a person's age and will aggressively pursue those he is attracted to. He witnessed Vic repeatedly encroaching on personal space, especially with women and teenagers, listing examples such as putting a hand on the wall above a female's head, touching females on the shoulder and arms, and whispering into their ears. He has witnessed Vic talk down to and yell at convention staff. He was dismissive of his handlers and would throw fits when he couldn't get his way. Uh, Vic was a 
pain in the ass to work with. Staff that were not large males were treated in a rude manner by Vic. He claims to have heard stories about Vic's inappropriate conduct for a long time, over 20 years. He heard this through the upper levels of the convention industry and the voice acting world. He believes the higher level staff and boards of various conventions have not been able to get enough direct evidence in order to deal with Vic's behavior uh, properly. Uh, he believes Vic has left a number of victims across the country due to celebrity status and opportunity. He claims that smaller conventions put up with Vic because his fans will spend a lot of money. He claims that even though he left TechoCon in 2014, Vic was blacklisted again in 2018. The next piece of evidence is the deposition of Monica Rial, which is only a fraction of the size of uh, Vic's, only going to about 80 pages or so. Uh, but all the same, I will be reading it alongside Vic's uh, deposition once we get there. It should be noted that included in her deposition is a number of tweets and public statements made by Monica Rial, uh, typically the ones that she had regarding Vic, but those accusations are all covered in her deposition. Did not mean to go there. So we'll cover those basically when we get there. The next piece of evidence is the deposition of Ronald Toyer. Again, we're going to be skipping over this. It is another lengthy prospect. Uh, I don't remember how many pages this go. And it's it's weird that the, the defense copy of this is missing so much detail. I don't know why this is blanked out. I don't know exactly how that can... I guess it's a redaction, maybe? Um, but it does go on for some time. Actually, it might go on longer than Vix. No, no, it's still about a third shorter than Vix. The next piece of evidence is the declaration of Jay Sean Lemoyne. Uh, Jay Sean Lemoyne is an attorney licensed in November of 2000 with a uh, practice based out of the DFW Metroplex. He represents defendants Monica Rial and Ronald Toyer. He lists a number of documents attached to the deposition of Victor Mignogna listed in this motion. Additionally, he attempts to connect Nicholas Riqueda of Riqueda Law to this lawsuit via Riqueda's establishment of the Vic Kicks Back GoFundMe war chest. He infers a number of threats against witnesses against Vic made during a number of Riqueda's streams, primarily threats against publicity of their information and contact to their employers. He then quotes one instance of a quote by Riqueda describing Quartz unearthing the identities of anonymous posters on Pretty Ugly Little Liars, and states that a number of lawyers in this case could leak their identities to the press. Look, I I'm going to be honest on this one. This entire document is a pretty flimsy and transparent attempt to drag Riqueda to the stand. Like, there is nothing substantial here beyond the formation of the GoFundMe, which is already a matter of public record. The fact that Riqueda is commenting on the case is nothing. It's press rights to comment on ongoing litigation. There's accusations of threats, but any threats made by Riqueda would require a separate legal action against Riqueda himself, and would be only tangentially involved in this case. So this entire declaration seems more like grandstanding than anything else. Which is weird, because you don't really expect people to grandstand in a document, but I've heard of it before, so... Uh, the next piece of evidence, which is more just kind of a... I, I think a, a housekeeping thing, is this timeline of events for Vic Mignogna, which uh, looks a little less substantial to uh, my timeline, which you should check out. It's the first video in this entire series. Uh, no, but seriously, this is... I, I guess it's just here to keep keep track of things. Make, makes some sense to me. The final piece of evidence in the initial filing is the declaration of Monica Rial. This declaration complains about harassment from Vic Mignogna's supporters towards Rial. Uh, why this is included, I don't know. Uh, unless they have evidence of Vic specifically instructing his supporters to harass her, which I guess they're trying to argue with his instruction to spread positive messages. Um... This really serves no purpose. Uh, each bout of harassment, like Riqueda's alleged threats, would need to be treated as separate legal actions, unless a clear call to action would be linked to, uh, to Vic, which hasn't really been effectively established, at least by the evidence as presented. Actually, I lied. There is one more piece of evidence, but frankly, I don't know what the hell it is. It, it, it's, like, it's like a list of court cases, I guess? Um, 
I have no idea what this is, frankly. If anyone knows what this is, please tell me. Because I, I, am, I am lost. I don't, I don't know what, what this is. Now, in addition to the initial filing, there is a supplement to the filing, which adds extra affidavits. I believe just affidavits, so there might be a declaration in here or something somewhere. Uh, yeah, no, it's just three, four affidavits to the, the evidence of the defendants. So um, I'm going to go through that. Even though there has been a motion to strike on part of the plaintiff, but it hasn't been ruled upon, so it's still technically in evidence, so it's important. Um, I, I guess he made his decision based upon that. Again, there were some weird evidentiary things going on in this case. Uh, the first two pieces of evidence I'm actually looping together because they are twin sisters are the affidavits of Elizabeth and Teresa Yost, recounting an almost sexual encounter with Vic Mignogna. Uh, the two are twins that have been going to conventions since 2012. They met Vic Mignogna on in February 2013 while at Comic-Con in Birmingham, Alabama. After visiting numerous conventions, they noticed Vic continued to recognize them, would let them cut in line for autographs, spend extra time with them at his table, and give them long hugs and kisses on the cheek. At this time, they had no inclination of sexual interest from him. They, they have seen Vic grope, kiss, and touch fans in a way that they now believe inappropriate. After finding Vic's email on his fan website, they began to exchange emails. The emails were friendly, but fairly shallow in topic, typically about his next convention dates. At ColossalCon 2014 in Sandusky, Ohio, they exchanged phone numbers with Vic. In 2015, they went to Anime Blues Con in Memphis, Tennessee. Vic was one of only a few guest stars. During this convention, the pair expressed interest in hanging out with Vic while they chatted in the hotel lobby during check-in. On the Saturday of that convention, he invited them to his hotel room with the intent of getting a break from being around fans. They did not suspect anything going into the encounter thanks to the age gap and Vic's relationship with Michelle Specht. At his hotel room, he gave the usual long hugs and cheek kisses. The first half of the visit was uneventful. Supposedly, when Vic was asked why he wasn't hanging out with other voice actors like Todd Haberkorn, uh, Vic responded by saying Todd, among other voice actors, uh, was at a cosplay strip show and used that as a segue to imply the sisters should give him a strip show as well. This alarmed the two of them who were caught off guard. They responded with silence. After more advances, they further questioned Vic's intentions to express explicit interest in having sexual relationships with the two of them. The two tried to talk him out of trying to make advances for the purpose of making him leave them alone so they could leave the room. Vic then expressed a desire to kiss them on the lips. They expressed discomfort as he was at least 50 and they were 22. Vic then rants about how age is just a number and it's how you feel, not how you look, while also self-complimenting his own good looks for his age. The girls bring up Michelle Specht, and Vic readily dismisses his fiance, which shocks the girls due to his Christian faith. He expressed that them accepting the invitation to his room would mean the three would finally become intimate. With the girls already uncomfortable and it clear that nothing sexual would happen, Vic asked to say goodbye and give a kiss. The girls supposedly hesitate in responding, and Vic forcibly kisses both of them on the lips. Both were stunned silent and left horrified at the encounter. After leaving, the two broke down into tears in the elevator and were too scared to be alone that evening. Following the convention, Vic emailed both girls to apologize and ask if they could still be friends. The girls replied genially, but did not continue to associate with him. They since avoided running into Vic at all future conventions. At 2017, at Acon in Fort Worth, Texas, the two encountered Vic while in line for autographs for a different actor. He still recognized them and greeted them with sarcasm and passive aggressiveness. Since 2015, they have heard a number of stories about Vic's bad reputation. The pair shared their story with Tammy Denbo for the Sony investigation. They also told Monica Rial and Ronald Toye their encounter in connection with the investigation. The next piece of evidence is the affidavit of Amanda McManus. She is the director of Anime Milwaukee, but has worked a number of conventions at the executive level since 2004. She has served as the personal handler for Vic at multiple conventions in the past, on January 30th, 2019, Anime Milwaukee mutually cancelled Vic's appearance and announced it via Twitter. She suggested the convention pay Vic his full guest appearance of $3,500 in order to maintain professionalism on such short notice. This transaction was completed on March 22nd, 2019 by the convention uh, chair. 
They decided to cancel his appearance in January with the public accusations only serving as one factor for the decision. She states that rumors about Vic have been present before, but none substantiated or actionable before what was accused in mid-January. Weight was put on pre-planning and on-site work, the anti-harassment policies that are championed by their organization, and the poor reception Vic may have received himself from their con-goers at that point, so the decision was made to cancel him. She states the decision was not made under pressure from Rial, Toye, Marky, or Funimation. The next and final piece of evidence is the affidavit of Raymond Lenzner. He is the director of Camicon, the largest anime and gaming annual convention out of Birmingham, Alabama. On January 4th, 2019, they announced Vic's appearance as a guest. On January 31st, 2019, they announced the cancellation of that appearance. Neither Monica Rial nor Ronald Toye affected the decision to remove Vic. In January 2019, he became aware of drama and tension in the anime community around Vic. The decision to cancel came from both opposing fan bases becoming hostile, threatening the safety of guests, fans, and staff alike. And that, my friends, is the relevant evidence presented by Monica Rial and Ronald Toye. The next video will feature the evidence presented by the plaintiff in this case, Victor Mignana. If you found this recap informative, please like this video, hit the subscribe button, and ring that bell. For more consistent updates, you can find me on Twitter at Raymond McNeil. Additionally, if you want to contribute directly to this channel, you can always donate to my Patreon at patreon.com slash CelticPhoenix. For one dollar or more, you get access to the Team Frostbite Discord server, where I, as well as other personalities that I regularly work with, interact with all of our fans. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll catch you all in the next video.